Besides EC2's tools for configuring and managing instances and data volumes, there's probably no service that will play as critical a role in your AWS-based projects as the Simple Storage Service, S3. Not only can you use it as a quick and cost-effective place to store and access your data, but because it's so tightly integrated with the entire range of AWS services, S3 is a perfect host for application-critical data elements. Whether it's as small as a simple script to run dynamic remote configuration processes, or a massive data set, at its core though, S3 is just a place where you can safely keep data objects, which we would normally call files. S3 is built around buckets. You can create a new bucket by simply clicking on Create Bucket and entering a name that's unique across the entire S3 system. The easiest way to do that is to choose a word and then add some numbers. You then select the region where you'd like your bucket to live. Placing your data in the region that's closest to the clients and devices that will use it can reduce latency and generally improve performance. Now let's enter our new bucket and upload a file. Click on Actions and then Upload. Click Add Files. Select a file or two from your local system and then click Start Upload. If you'd like to make this file publicly available on the internet, select the file, click on Actions, and select Make Public. Now click on the Properties tab to the right and note the link's address which contains the URL users can use to access your file. Keeping track of access activity involving your S3 buckets can be an effective security and performance tool. The S3 access logs are built for this purpose. To activate logging for a particular bucket, click once on the Edit icon next to your bucket and then on the Properties tab at the right assuming it's not already selected. Expand the logging item and select Enabled. Choose a target bucket, that is, the bucket into which you'd like the logs to be saved. This obviously doesn't have to be the same bucket you're monitoring. If you might need to more easily distinguish these logs from long lists of files, edit the target prefix to be more visually recognizable to you. Now any user or API request to your bucket, whether successful or not, will be logged to your target bucket. You will only be billed standard storage and access rates. Besides access notification, S3 events can also be configured to trigger notifications to Amazon Simple Notification Service, SNS, Amazon Simple Queue Service, SQS, or to a Lambda function to programmatically alert users or processes within your AWS project. This allows S3 events to trigger activity within your AWS workflows. Expand Events in the Properties frame of your bucket window, and then type a name for your new event. Click once in the Events box to display a menu of choices. We'll choose RRS Object Lost, an event in the Reduced Redundancy Storage Object class, by the way. Notifications can be sent to an SNS Topic, SQS Queue, or Lambda Function. We'll select SNS Topic. We'll take just a quick detour to create a new SNS Topic. From the main AWS dashboard, click on SNS, and then on Create Topic. Enter a descriptive name for your topic and a display name. They can be the same if you like. In order for this topic to be useful, we'll have to create a subscription. That is, you'll have to subscribe some recipients to the topic who will actually read about it and hopefully respond. You can have the topic notifications sent to HTTP, email, SQS, or an application endpoint. We'll add an email address, which we'll need to confirm once it arrives in our email client. We now have an active topic. Back on the S3 Events page, we can now select our topic. Select Add SNS Topic ARN from the SNS Topic box and then paste the ARN of our new topic in the box below. Notice of any RRS Objects Lost events will now be automatically sent to our SNS subscription. By the way, since we mentioned RRS, we might as well explain what it's all about. Back in our S3 dashboard, if we click on the Details tab of a file's properties, we see that we're able to choose between standard and reduced redundancy storage. Standard storage, since its data is replicated over so many facilities, promises durability up to 99.9999999% that is 99 and 9 nines. RRS, on the other hand, is designed to provide only 99.99% durability, which isn't too bad either. The main difference is cost. Spread over large volumes of data, RRS can come in at around 15 to 20 percent cheaper. However, RRS isn't for every project. If you're storing data that, for instance, could be recreated if it was lost, but you'd rather avoid the trouble, then you might be a good candidate for RRS.
you can tightly control access to individual S3 files or to entire buckets for all users using permissions. Let's look at the permissions associated with our new bucket. The owner, that's me, is currently allowed to list, update, delete, and view and edit permissions. There's also a log delivery grantee to allow access for our logs. We could create a new permissions rule by clicking Add More Permissions and selecting a user from the drop-down grantee box. Let's select Everyone and then click Upload Delete. Anyone will now have control over all the contents of this bucket. You can also add a custom bucket policy to specific files within a bucket. S3 can also, in some cases, be a very cheap place to host static websites. I'm going to upload a couple of HTML files that will serve nicely as a simple website. Now we'll head back to the All Buckets page, select our bucket, and then once again click on the Properties tab to the right. Now expand Static Web Hosting and select Enable Web Hosting. Enter the name of our new index.html file for the index document and click Save. Now note the endpoint. Until we reroute traffic from a custom domain to it, this will be the way users can access our website. Let's visit the site. HTML links are live. Naturally, Amazon also offers full terminal console access to S3 objects and buckets through the AWS command line interface. From a shell session on which the AWS CLI is installed and that's already authenticated into the AWS system, they can try to upload an object to our bucket. Let's use S3CP, the name of the file, and we'll point that at S3 colon slash slash and the name of our bucket. Let's now display a list of all objects in the bucket using AWS S3 LS for list. We can also use S3 as a synchronized backup system using sudo AWS S3 sync, the name of a local file or directory that we'd like to be synced in the cloud, and the name of our new bucket. Then dash dash delete. Let's explain that. All the files in slash var slash log will be uploaded and synchronized. That means the next time this command is run, only those files that have been added or changed will be uploaded, greatly reducing time and bandwidth costs. The delete argument tells S3 to remove any archive files in the bucket whose sources on my computer have been deleted. We use sudo because some files in our local var log directory are read protected. Using the command line interface, we just demonstrated how to use S3 to store and sync your data. Now we'll explore managing your S3 objects over the long term in ways that increase data integrity and keep costs down. Earlier, we synced data between a local computer and an S3 bucket using the delete argument. This meant that once a file was deleted in the local archive, it would be removed from the S3 synced bucket the next time sync was run. It would also completely overwrite older versions of the same file. This might not fit your needs in every case. AWS allows versioning to protect data against accidental deletion or overwriting. You activate versioning at the bucket level. In the All Buckets page, select the bucket you'd like to work with, and then, if it isn't already, click on the Properties tab on the right. Expand Versioning. And after reading AWS's warning, always a good idea by the way, click on Enable Versioning. The Enable Versioning button has been replaced by a Suspend Versioning button. Suspending versioning will not affect existing objects, but will prevent further duplication. Let's try it out. We'll enter our bucket and upload a file from the local computer. Now I've edited the local file and saved it to create, effectively, a new version. Now let's upload the updated file, which has the exact same file name as before. Notice the two versions tabs at the top. We'll click on the Show tab and both versions of our file are now visible and are available for any purpose.